Hi, my name is Jake Miller, and today we will be discussing the importance of diet and exercise in large captive crocodilians. So to start off, overweight and obese animals are something that's pretty common within captivity, and crocodilians are no exception to this. And large crocodilians, when we look at them in, in a captive setting, there's three things to consider. First off, we need to acknowledge the lifestyle of these animals. Crocodilians aren't really active animals to begin with. Typically, they're either laying on land basking or they're in the water just resting. And even when they're hunting in the wild, they're not really expending a lot of energy. And typically, what they're going to do is they're going to wait at the water's edge and they're going to wait for a prey to come to them and then they'll strike. Or if they're hunting in the water, typically what they're going to do is they're going to lay underwater with their jaws open and wait for something like a fish to swim by. So they're not really active animals to begin with. The second thing to consider is how the food is actually presented to them in captivity. Um, is the food being simply tossed to them? Is the keeper station training them? They have to come to a station. Does the animal have to actually follow the keeper around and kind of work for its food? Another thing to consider too in this category is what is the food actually being given to the animal? Is it a whole prey item? Is it part of a prey item? Is it pellets? How much food is the animal getting? All these are really important considerations when we're trying to assess if the animal is obese or overweight or if it potentially will become overweight. And the third thing, particularly with the large species of crocodilians, such as say saltwater crocodile, Nile crocodile, American alligator, is a lot of facilities, because they look at crocodilians, the larger species as already large animals, if an animal's overweight, they're not gonna really pay too much attention to it because they just think this is already a naturally large animal. But because a species does get to a larger size, doesn't mean that we shouldn't acknowledge when the animal is getting a little bit too big. And so why is it important that we look over this important detail with animals being too big? Well, uh, right here is a chart that compares wild versus captive American alligators. Uh, captive alligators being in black and wild ones being in gray. And this chart specifically is looking at body condition scores. And so the captive individuals, the black ones, are having much higher scores generally compared to similarly sized or lengthwise animals that are in the wild. So because we, the, we see the captive animals are a little bit predisposed to being a little bit heavier, we need to really make sure that we are handling this appropriately. It's okay for crocodilians to be a little bit overweight, um, but we wanna make sure that we maintain that. We don't want them to become too big. We don't want them to become obese. And being zoo professionals, we want to make sure that the overall health of the animal is still good. We want to make sure they're healthy. We want to make sure that they live a long quality of life. And what's really important too is because a lot of these animals are on display, we want to make sure that we are presenting animals that are good representations of their species. We want to tell guests this is what the species is supposed to look like in the wild. We shouldn't have, or at least we should strive for, healthy individuals. We shouldn't try to have overweight and obese animals on display if we don't have to. And so the first thing that we need to think of when trying to address this problem is how do we tell if an animal actually is obese? And so what we have here is a body condition score chart for crocodilians in general. Um, there's going to be some variation within species, of course, um, but this is a pretty good chart. And mainly we're going to look at the area of the articular bones and mainly the neck region, the scapula. Um, if, there, if the area is really thick around the neck, um, if you're not going to be able to palpate for the articular bones, you've got an animal that's overweight and potentially obese. You don't want that. You want to have an animal that definitely has a muscular neck and definitely has um, a good set of jaw muscles but you don't want a really big, thick, obese animal. Another thing to consider too with captive crocodilians is a lot of times their skulls will actually change shape um, and will deviate from what they would look like if they were from the wild. Um, so here particularly um, in this example are two skulls from American alligators. And so the one on the right is a wild individual. 
And wild American alligators are typically going to have a more longer, uh, smooth, uniform U-shape. Versus a captive alligator, um, depending on how it's been fed, and this can be several factors, but diet is definitely important. Captive individuals can have very thick, very wide, robust skulls. And in some instances, um, depending on the degree of metabolic bone disease, the teeth can be very much sprawled, which should not be the case. And so what we have here is a real change in the skull morphology from the wild individuals. And some people will literally say that the captive skulls almost look like a different species from the wild skulls. And that's something that we shouldn't have happen. Um, we should strive to have the skulls look as much like the wild skulls as possible. And so to put everything in perspective in a real world example, I'm going to tell the story of a couple different crocodiles from the St. Augustine alligator farm. First off is Gomek. He was a nearly 18 foot saltwater crocodile from Papua New Guinea. Uh, he was caught from the wild and he ended up in the St. Augustine alligator farm to be displayed. And Gomek, when he was fed, what would happen is um, he would come up to the edge of the water and he would raise himself up and he would, uh, he would be presented nutria. And there's a couple of main problems here. One is as much as Gomek has to move for his food, it's not really a great form of exercise for him. Um, and secondly, and this is a really important thing, the nutria he was being fed wasn't actually fulfilling the nutritional requirements uh, for him as being such a large crocodile. When I spoke with John Brugan of the St. Augustine Alligator Farm, he told me that what was going on with the nutria was when the hunters were giving the uh, nutria away after they skinned them, they weren't actually giving them a real whole prey item. What was going on is when they ripped the skin and the pelts off, the guts were falling out. And so the nutria were lacking in vitamin A and vitamin E for their captive crocodilians. And so because Gomek was being fed this so often, he was being fed essentially a you know somewhat unhealthy diet. And because of this, he eventually died of what essentially was a heart attack. And so because of what happened to Gomek, the St. Augustine Alligator Farm knew they had to change the way um, they were going to care for their next large saltwater crocodile. And so their new saltwater crocodile, which is currently on display, is Maximo. Maximo is a little bit under 16 feet. He came from a crocodile farm in Australia. And when they brought him to the St. Augustine Alligator Farm, um, they changed two things from Gomek. First off, his diet no longer included uh, nutria. What they did is they changed it to lab-grown rodents, quail, and chicken. A much more complete whole prey diet that was much more healthy for him. But the second thing, and this is the really important thing, Maximo has to work for his food now. What he has to do is he has to get up out of the water onto land to the first feed station. And then he has to crawl across his enclosure to the second feed station and then get his food there. And then for the third feed station, he has to get back into the water and the keeper will actually hang a prey item above him. And he will have to actually leap vertically out of the water and grab it. So Maximo actually, in a way, has to hunt for his food. He's working for it. He has to exercise for it. This is what we want um, in terms of the welfare for these animals. We want to make sure that these crocodiles are actually working for their food. They're staying fit. They're staying healthy. Um, and they're being fed a very well diet. Maximo is, a very, is very much a lean crocodile. He's muscular. This is what we want from a captive large crocodilian. And so in conclusion, um, we need to make sure that we can tell if the animals are becoming overweight. Um, secondly, we need to make sure that in training these animals, there should be a form of exercise involved because that very much is going to be important for the welfare of these animals. And thirdly, we need to make sure that their diet is appropriate for them, both in quantity and quality. So here are my references for this presentation and thank you so much for watching and I hope you have a great day. Hey everyone, so this video was actually a recorded lecture I had to do for an animal behavior class and I thought it would be a good idea to upload it to the channel. After working on this class project, I definitely want to do a more in-depth video on this subject. 
I've actually been meaning to make a video like this for a while, but the class assignment was what kind of pushed me to get more information together. Big thank you to John Bruggen of the St. Augustine Algier Farm for doing the interview some time ago, and I'll be releasing pieces of that recorded interview in future videos. Looking forward to working on more videos about giant crocodilians in captivity, and thanks for watching. To learn more about the animals you just saw, buy the second edition of What We Get Wrong About Crocodilians. It examines claims of giant crocodiles, a World War II massacre, regenerating tales, algiers in the sewers, their record land speeds, and more. The book examines claims many, including experts, get wrong about these animals, and the second edition includes updated information, pictures, and more. Buy What We Get Wrong About Crocodilians, the second edition, in physical or digital formats. Link in bio, comments, or description to buy.